Good afternoon. Welcome to Autism Spectrum Disorder, Assessment and Treatment of Feeding Challenges. My name is Erin Prophet, and I'll be going through our objectives today. I will also be defining the relationship between autism spectrum disorders and their related feeding challenges. Gina will be going through the assessment protocols and considerations, and Bailey will be describing treatment methodologies and rationale. And we hope that you leave our talk with resources for your SLP toolbox. As you know, autism is a neurological disorder largely characterized by social or communication deficits. Children with autism also present with difficulties with fine or gross motor, prosodic variations in their voice, and sensory impairments or food intolerances, leading us to our feeding discussion today. Researchers estimate the rate of feeding problems in ASD to be as high as 90%, with 70% of those children described as selective eaters. Research indicates that feeding difficulties in infancy may be an early sign of autism. As autism rates continue to rise, you may find these children on your caseload. When you're considering feeding difficulties, pay attention to physical growth, social interactions with peers and family, the family relationships, behavior, and sensory aspects. When working with children with autism and feeding, be considerate of sensory-based feeding problems, such as avoiding certain textures or colors, or a preference for starches, or even preferring same foods at the same temperature presented in the same way in the same environment. Also consider aversive eating behaviors such as refusing food, choking, gagging, or spitting out food. Hi, I'm Gina Moriarty and I'll be discussing the evaluation of feeding and autism. The first question we want to ask is, is there a problem? We'll talk about things to determine that, such as a screener, a food diary, and a caregiver interview. If we determine that there is a problem, we'll want to know what's the nature of the problem. We'll talk about the multidisciplinary team approach, what we'll look at in an observation, and finally the different assessments we can use and the analysis of our findings. Okay, the first thing we want to ask is, is there a problem? Is a child a picky eater or really a problem feeder? Well, let's take a look. This information is also in your handout for your reference. A couple things about the picky eater. They'll have a decreased range of foods and they might burn out on things, but they'll eat them eventually. They all, they're able to tolerate foods on their plate. They'll eat foods from different textures and categories. They might eat some different foods from the family, but they'll typically add new foods after enough presentations. A problem feeder is going to probably eat less than 20 foods and ones that are lost aren't brought back. They might be crying or breaking down with the presentation of new foods. They may not eat entire categories of foods like all fruits or all vegetables or maybe even all green foods. They always eat different foods in the family and they typically need many, many more presentations to eat new foods. A uh, general rule is if a child's caregivers are just incredibly exhausted, every mealtime is a battle, and they can't get their child to eat and obtain enough nutrients, then it's typically going to be a feeding evaluation that's needed. One of these things is a food diary. Ask the caregivers to keep a record of three days of what the child eats and does not eat. Record everything presented and note the kind of reactions that you get to the different foods. Look for patterns in this diary. Look and see if they're avoiding certain textures or certain categories, maybe even certain colors of foods. A food diary can give you a hint as what kind of things are really going on on a daily basis. One of the most important parts of determining if there's a problem is the caregiver interview. We want to find out a little bit more about the child's early medical history and feeding history, something about their developmental and feeding milestones, definitely some things about their regulation, how they sleep and their toileting habits, because sometimes there are feeding issues and these types of habits might be related. One might be affecting the other. We'd like a description of the meal times, how things are going at home, both what they're eating but also behaviorally. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit more about the family food preferences and a because what the family eats might also affect what the child is eating. We'd like to know what the caregiver expectations are. What do they expect of the child, both in what kinds of nutrition they're getting and how they expect the child to behave at mealtimes. And as always, we do want to be sensitive to any kind of cultural considerations of the family. 
Now, an important thing to remember, before moving to a full evaluation, the child must be medically cleared of any kind of contributing medical conditions that might affect their feeding. Is the swallowing structure adequate and functional for feeding? We also have to consider allergies or maybe GI concerns. Other miscellaneous concerns for children with autism might also be something like pica, where they're eating non-food items such as sand or dirt or sometimes even ash or detergent. Also, if they have severe self-injurious behaviors that are related to feeding, that's something that we might want to get checked out before going on to a full feeding evaluation. Okay, now let's say you've looked at things like the food diary and the caregiver questionnaire, and you've determined that the child probably is a problem feeder. And next we want to determine, well, what's the nature of the problem? So we need to move on to a multidisciplinary evaluation. Now this is going to consist of a few different team members. Part of it's going to be, of course, the caregiver and the child, the speech language pathologist, which is all of you. Uh, we're going to have an occupational therapist, which is going to look at sensory processing, fine motor skills and positioning. Um, different types of physicians might be involved. We also want to look at having a dietitian or nutritionist on our team to give us recommendations for food intake and calories. And also we might be looking at having a behavioral specialist join us as well. As part of the team, we're going to want to look at a couple different types of assessment measures for the child that has feeding issues. One might be a food preference inventory, which has been used in quite a few studies, where they have a list of more than 100 common foods. They have about five different categories, which considers both what the child will eat and what the parent will eat. And it's able to be repeated during therapy so that you can see if the child is adding foods as you go. Uh, the Brief Autism Mealtime Behavior Inventory is actually a standardized instrument. And this one in particular was specially developed for children with autism. Now there's other standardized instruments that are out there, but this one was specifically developed for children with autism because it not only has um, investigates food varieties and food refusals, but it also considers different features of autism. And this one is completed by a parent rating scale. One of the most important assessment tools that you'll have as an SLP is the observation. You want to look at the child behaviors. Are they throwing food or utensils? Are they accepting the food by opening their mouth? Or are they refusing it by maybe putting their hands in front of their mouth to block the food? Are they requesting or feeding themselves? Are they paying attention to the people around them and to their food? Also, the caregiver interaction with the child, like are they making eye contact with the child? What about the presentation of the food? Is it kind of organized or is it just kind of thrown and jumbled onto a plate? Are they giving prompts and praise to the child and encouraging the child to eat? And all the overall comments that they might make during the feeding experience, whether they're positive or negative. And as always, we want to take a look at the environmental concerns and what context the child succeeds in. Okay, now that you're done with your part of the assessment, you're going to sit down with the rest of the team and do a comprehensive review of the data to determine if treatment is necessary. Then, if yes, you're going to create a treatment plan with individualized goals and methodologies because, as you all know, if you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. And we need to make sure that this is specific to their individual needs. Hi, I'm Bailey and I'll be discussing treatment approaches. There are several different treatment approaches when it comes to feeding and autism. Mealtime LLC and food chaining are discussed briefly in your handout and we will be discussing sequential oral sensory in further depth. Sequential oral sensory is a transdisciplinary program developed by Kay Toomey. It integrates posture, sensory, motor, and behavioral learning, medical, and nutritional factors. We selected SOS treatment because it integrates multiple aspects, particularly the sensory aspects that we frequently observe in children with autism. SOS is an appropriate treatment for children ages 12 months to 5 years old who present with feeding or weight and growth problems. Researchers found that children with definite sensory problems had more eating problems than those with typical performance. These problems include textures, particular food groups, specific sensory input, sensitivities to temperature, color, flavor, feel, or smell. SOS uses five steps to their treatment approach. These steps include tolerating the food, interacting with the food, smelling the food, touching the food, and finally eating the food. 
When a child tolerates the food, they should be able to be in the same room as the food, tolerate food being at the table, allow food to be near their plate, or be able to have the food on their plate. The pictures you see is a child who only eats plain original goldfish. We try to integrate the colored goldfish by setting it on her placemat. That way she could tolerate the food being near her other food. The second step is interaction. The child should learn to play with their food, possibly by using utensils or using other food items, or possibly helping prepare food in the kitchen. In the pictures here, you're seeing a child play with the green fish. She's touching it, she's moving it around, she's even touching it to other fish in the picture. She's also holding it up to her eye and making it swim. The third step is the child should be able to tolerate the smell of the food. This includes being in the same room as the food, being at the table with the food, having the food on their plate, or even lifting the food to their nose as seen in the photograph. The fourth step is touch. The child should begin to accept the food on their fingers and hands, arms, shoulders, cheeks, chin, lips, and tongue as shown in the picture below. Step five is taste. In this picture, the child is licking the food and then he threw the food away. Following the progression, the child should be able to lick the food, take a bite of the food, hold it in their mouth, suck on it, chew it, and finally eat the food. In conclusion, it's time to check yourself. So let's go through the objectives. Think about them and pair and share with your neighbor. Can you define the relationship between autism spectrum disorder and feeding challenges? And outline assessment protocols and considerations and describe treatment methodologies and rationale. We've provided a handout for you to add to your growing toolbox as you head out into this magnificent endeavor.